Hey guys, thanks for tuning into our church service for this week. It's great to see you. Um, I'm going to be singing a song, and the purpose of this worship time in our services online is to encourage you to spend time with God. And so, if you feel like you can actually spend time with God more without actually watching a video of me playing some music, and if that distracts you, then please actually pause your video and spend some time with Him, spend some time praising Him and thanking Him for what He's doing in your life. But if you actually would like to sing along um, at home, or whether these words that I'm about to sing um, will actually be able to help you lead closer to God and help encourage you to spend time with Him, then please do that. I'm going to be singing a song called In Christ Alone. A lot of us know it. And it's just about how, you know, even in this crazy season that we're in, we can still find all of our hope in the name of Jesus. And we can still, you know, believe that He is the firm foundation of our lives and worship Him in all that we do. So I encourage you to either sing along, to pause the video, or just uh, spend some time with Him by yourself, or just meditate on these lyrics. And I'm going to be worshipping God, so I'd love you to join me as well. Dear God, we thank you that we can worship you right now, no matter where we are. And I pray, Father, that you help us to today 
to just get closer to you, to spend time with you, to know you for who you really are, to know more of your love today. In your holy name, amen. Hi everyone, it's good to have you dropping in on our message centering in on Galatians 3 for the weekend commencing the 15th of August. Uh, my name is Stephen Punch and I'm part of the pastoral team here at Maitland Baptist Church. So here we are again, we, we find ourselves um, in an online environment um, connecting with you and, and as a leadership team we we made a decision that uh, that we would not be meeting as a, a, as a large church group on on our premises, um, uh, as as a way of better looking after each other um, while we go through this COVID crisis. And it's our hope that that we would instead take the opportunities to meet with each other in the smaller groups in our homes as a way of staying connected with each other. So we'll continue to support you as, as much as we can over this time and uh, we'll be trying to, um, to provide you with some details of, of how you might be able to, um, to, to stay, stay connected over this period. So our message this morning is focusing in on, on Galatians chapter 3 and it's a great passage when, um, when we consider how, how God has just shown himself to be so faithful um, across the ages and that uh, you and I today are able to experience the, the tremendous blessing that comes with the promise that Abraham, uh, that God had made to Abraham so long ago. So here we go, let's get into Galatians. Now the backstory into Galatians here is, is about a group of Jewish Christians who arrive in Galatia sometime after Paul's missionary journey to the region. Paul's teaching focus to the Galatians had been on salvation coming to men and women through faith and belief in Jesus. However, this group of Jewish Christians had come up with this kind of hybrid belief system and it, and it, and it, was, it went like this, that Jesus was a Jew, Jesus came to the Jews, Jesus lived as a Jew, Jesus died as a Jew, and if you want to enter salvation, then you first must become a Jew. Yes, they felt Jesus was important in pointing us to God, but because he was Jewish, um, they felt that Christians must first become Jewish and thereby adhere to all the traditional practices of the Jewish law, and that might have been things like, uh, like circumcision, eating kosher foods, obeying the Sabbath, as well as, well as a whole heap of other stuff. So they, they felt that you had to adhere to these practices before salvation in Jesus could come into effect. What they were really saying is that the work of Jesus on the cross was not sufficient in and of itself for salvation. They were complicating what was a very simple message of belief and faith in Jesus and the Galatian church was buying into it. So we're going to break this morning's passage down into two parts. We'll look at verses 1 roughly through to the middle of 6, and then we'll look at verses 7 to 14 a little later on. So when we, when we walk into Galatians chapter 3, we, we see Paul really putting the Christians in Galatia over the rack. Um, you can sense this frustration in Paul that they could so quickly move away from the true and simple gospel that he'd been communicating to them and, and that they could be sucked into the false teaching um, of this group of Jewish Christians. And he wants them to take a deep breath and think, really think about what they're doing. So let's, let's read this first part of Galatians 3. You foolish Christians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. And I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you His Spirit 
and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing in what you heard. So Paul's coming down really heavy on the Galatians here, but he's doing this not just because he's not because he wants to be mean, but because he's genuinely concerned about them running off track and missing the blessing that God has for them. So Paul is putting six questions to them. And uh, th there's a guy, uh, Paul Laboudier, uh, who is part of Calvary Chapel in Ontario in Canada. And he's kind of reframed these six, these six questions in a way that I think um, gives us a, a slightly better insight into the heart of what Paul was asking them. So firstly, he says to them, who has bewitched you or, or who has invaded your heart and stolen your ability to think? Now, bewitched is a word that was used at the time to talk about pagan magic arts. Essentially, it was a kind of satanic power. And a singular who, as Paul refers to it here, suggests that there is someone working behind the scenes, a subtle and deceiving power um, that's exerting strong influence over the minds of this specific group of, of Christians. And we see Paul expand on this further in Ephesians chapter 6, where he says that, you know, the battles we face, they're essentially spiritual ones. They're not against the forces of this world, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So both Jesus and Peter warn that the followers of, of Jesus need to be on the watch for those who would try to steal, kill and destroy. And what better way for Satan to try and erode the foundation of the early church than to steal their faith, in the, their faith away from the sufficiency of what Jesus had done for them on the cross? And that was the issue. That's what the Jewish legalists were trying to challenge that what Jesus did on the cross was not enough. He was so, they were saying that you also need to adhere to the Mosaic law. The second thing that, that Paul levels at the church, it, it, the question is, that does a person receive God's Holy Spirit because of keeping rules or because of believing God's word? Paul was wanting to remind them of how, of how they'd already received the Holy Spirit and he wanted them to think back to that time. He's trying to remind them of when he was with them before and how he preached all about Jesus and they believed and they received the Holy Spirit. And God's Holy Spirit moved on, that, on them at that time in, in very real and powerful, dynamic and supernatural ways and it could, couldn't be explained any other way than to say that God was with them. And so God's Holy Spirit didn't show up because they, they worked hard to earn his presence in their lives. The Spirit showed up because they believed. The Holy Spirit didn't show up because they were following a whole system of rules, but because they put their faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work for them on the cross. And we need to take care today that, that we don't fall into this, this trap of thinking that we need to earn our salvation. You know, in, in, in our culture, we place a lot of emphasis on what we're able to do based on our own energy, our own drive, our own imagination, skills and hard work. We say to ourselves, you know, wow, I've achieved this thing because I've worked hard and I've earned it. This in itself is not always a bad thing, particularly when we're trying to teach our kids, for example, how to value things. But this type of thing, this type of thinking can be a barrier to us understanding how the true and simple gospel of Jesus works. In our need to earn it type culture, we don't always know how to respond to a no strings attached gift. This idea is a bit counterculturalist, you know, the kind of thing if it's if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And we feel awkward. Sometimes we would prefer to pay for it. And Cherie and I have, have experienced a similar thing trying to sell stuff uh, that we haven't needed um, as we renovate our house. Uh, we're trying to get rid of it. We, we, we say it's for free and no one takes it. But as soon as we put a price on it, we don't have any trouble selling it. So people would prefer to pay for something that we would actually want to give away for nothing. But this is the way the gospel works, that Jesus offers salvation to us as a gift. And that's all that's required of us, is to receive the gift by believing in who he is and what he has done for us. 
And we can see how God's plan for offering on the gift of salvation works contrary to human nature. We want to say to ourselves, I did it and I earned it. It's mine. But God said, hey, I did it for you. Let's not forget what Paul says in Galatians in the previous, in the previous chapter, where he says, you know, if righteousness were through the law alone, then Christ died for no purpose. The third question that Paul uh, aims at the Galatians, and it's, it's just as much an accusation, he says, he says to them, are you so foolish? Are you really unable to understand? And in the Greek, the word for foolish really meant mentally deficient. So it was a pretty, a pretty hard-hitting kind of comment that Paul was making. But he wants to try, he's desperate to try and figure out the reason for their lack of understanding. Because these people have already received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was still within them, I believe, urging them, urging them to, to listen to the truth. And yet they were being caught up by the, by the human reasoning of the Jewish legalists. And does this sound something like, like we might experience today and be guilty of? Um, that God's Spirit is urging us to stand firm on an issue, um, to do a certain thing, um, to submit an inner part of ourselves to Him, um, but instead we're distracted by other human influences that, that, that tell us that that's not really important or the world doesn't really work that way. So the next thing that Paul talks about, he says to them, Are you so unreasonable that having started your walk with Christ in the Spirit, that you now actually think you can improve on that work using your own fleshly abilities? And this question was a really big deal to Paul because he was totally and utterly convinced that he had nothing in and of himself that he could possibly add to the work of Jesus on the cross. There was nothing he could do um, that would add to the fact that Jesus has saved him. And Paul knew that he didn't have the ability to carry out ultimate goodness, even if he wanted to. That it actually isn't in his nature. He knew that he could never measure up. But the Galatians were beginning to be convinced that they could measure up. And that the works that they did and the traditions and the practices that they adhered to could actually count towards their salvation. And Paul goes on to say, hey, look, guys, if you think that having confidence in, in your flesh matters and want to start comparing resumes with me, then, OK, let's let's have it on. Because um, he says, I've got a, a resume that will blow you out of the water. And if anyone's got reason to boast, I have. Uh, he says to me, you know, remember who I was, an exceptional and an upwardly mobile Pharisee who knew and practiced the law back to front. And it was actually given the responsibility of breaking apart the early Christian church. But, but he realised through the revelation of Jesus in his life that he had nothing that he could in any way add to the work of Jesus. So what he's saying to them is, hey, you think you're good, but look, if I've got nothing that I can add to the work of Jesus, how can you guys possibly think you can? And he wasn't saying this to be arrogant, but he was saying to him, to to them, you know, that that as as good as you think you might, as good as you think you might be, or as good as I think I might be, that there's nothing that we can do to add to what Jesus has done. The next question he asks the Galatians is, has all your suffering as a follower of Christ been for nothing? We need to understand here that Paul believed that every trial and suffering that we went through actually served a purpose as a follower of Jesus. That as a follower, you'll actually receive a benefit from the suffering you go through. And we see this in his teaching, that all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And that suffering builds Christ-like character. And it also builds resilience um, and, and it grows us to maturity uh, in our faith. And Paul is saying to the Galatians, hey, what about all the hard stuff you've endured and the maturity that you've developed over these last years as you pushed into Jesus and allowed his spirit to work among you? Is all this worth nothing now simply because you've decided to move to a different course? 
And as Christians, we too, when, when tempted to follow a different path to that of Jesus, need to sometimes uh, look back and remember those, those instances when the Holy Spirit has spoken to us or revealed something special, special to us. And this has created within us this increased sense of confidence in, in who God is and his faithfulness to walk with us and to grow us. Looking back at the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives can often help us recenter ourselves when moving forward. And lastly, Paul asks the Galatians this question, and it's kind of very similar to the to the second question that he asked them, and it's because um, he really wants to drive home a point. And sometimes repetition is necessary because we don't get sometimes simple things. So he's saying to them, does God give his Holy Spirit and move miraculously among you because you keep God's law or because you hear and believe his word? And again, it's, it's so important for us to understand um, that our right relationship with God cannot be, cannot be earned. Now what a, what a horrible place for us to be where where we believe that uh, where we might believe that, that God won't be there for me, that he won't listen to my prayer, that he won't invest his spirit in, in me and grow me, that he won't bless me, all based on this idea, all based on this idea that if I'm failing to live up to his expectations to the law, um, that I'm not worth much to God. What an empty place to be where we feel that we're unworthy and we have no right to come and ask God of, of anything because we haven't been towing the line. If we believe this, then we're putting ourselves on the performance track where we say my value or worth to God and the time and attention that he gives me is totally dependent on how well I perform. And understand this, that God's love for you and me does not waver based on our mistakes and failures. It's, it's innate, it's inbuilt in his character to love you and I wholly and consistently and at all times and through all things. Our mistakes don't change his love for us any more than our successes do. Let's hear that, that our mistakes don't change his love for us any more than our successes do. God's grace allows us to come before his throne with boldness even when we feel ashamed. And it's possible for, for true, genuine Christians today to have their hearts stolen away from who Jesus is and the sufficiency of what he did for us. And it's so important to have a good foundation, a great foundation and a great anchor to be able to discern the truth from a lie. And I've seen I've seen Christians over over my my life experience um, abandon the true gospel for an ineffectual substitute. I've seen this a few times where um, it's very it's very sad and, and sometimes the substitute is very close to the true gospel and sometimes that makes it hard to discern the difference, to discern the truth from the lie. And sometimes, sometimes this belief system can be way left of centre. Um, as a bit of an example, I was talking to a guy earlier this year, and he would say that he's a Christian. But here's where he's landed in his faith, because he hasn't been able to come to terms with the fact that, um, that bad things happen to good people now and have happened to, happened to people in the past. This is where he's landed in, in, his, in terms of his faith. That the Bible is simply a book written by men. It contains some good and wise words and advice, but as far as being inspired by God, well, that's a bit of a stretch. He believes that our world is not an intentional creation by a creative God, um, that evolution explains all that we see. He believes that Jesus was, was just this guy, just this man who lived a good life and yes, worthy of, um, of being an example to others, but he certainly wasn't the son of God. That the idea of absolute right and wrong, so the idea of sin is actually kind of nonsensical because moral values and standards, they evolve and, and move as our, as our culture evolves and moves. 
And God means different things to different people. He's, he's more like this nebulous cosmic force. We just need to live good lives and, and this will ensure that somehow we end up in some okay future state. And I'm listening to this guy and I'm just thinking, wow, there's absolutely nothing left. He's stripped bare the frame of, of the faith that we have in Christ. He's reduced faith to, to a nothing, a kind of a performance gospel that I'll somehow be okay with someone if I live a good enough life. There's no hope in this and there's no real life in this and there's certainly no relationship with the person of God who loves us. So let's move on and have a look at the next section of Galatians. So roughly from verse 7 down to the end of verse 14. So Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham by saying all nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who, do, who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So Paul settles down to reason with the Galatian church about how faith, not the law, is the way to salvation. In order to do this, he takes them way back to the father of the nation of Israel, to this guy called Abraham, about 2,100 years before Jesus was born. And this guy, Abraham, sat in the Jewish Hall of Fame as their, as their pin-up boy, their great man of faith. So let's firstly look at the idea of a covenant and, and what is a covenant, because it's important in our understanding of this passage. So a covenant is generally an agreement between two or more parties. Um, some examples of a covenant that we might see today, for example, are a contract to buy a house or a car or a business. Uh, a type of covenant might be a marriage ceremony where, where a man and a woman commit each other um, to, to one another as, as a married couple. Or it could also be an employment contract that you sign um, to tell your employer you pay, you pay me a certain amount of money and I'll do this certain, this certain job for you. So that's essentially what a covenant is, an agreement between, between two or more parties. Back in the time of Abraham, there was a, there was a, a ritual that was uh, wrapped around um, the building of a covenant. And it, and it involved the parties to the covenant bringing animals, bringing animals uh, to, the, to wherever they were making this covenant. And they would actually cut the animals in two. It was a very gruesome and, and gory process. They would cut the animals in two and then they would separate the two animals. You can imagine the, the blood and, and the mess that was on the floor. The people who were making the agreement would then walk between the two animals and they would recite or pronounce their particular commitment in the covenant. What is it what, that they were going to do to uphold their end of the covenant? It was a very significant thing because it was a symbolic way of saying, look, this is a really serious thing and and may, may this or worse happen to me if, if I fail to uphold my end of the bargain. So, why was Paul making such a big deal out of Abraham and his relationship to God? And how do covenants fit into all of that? When we look at Genesis 15, we, we see, uh, we see a, a dialogue between God and between Abraham. 
We have to understand that when this is happening, Abraham's an older guy um, and his, his wife can't have children. But God sees something special in Abraham and something, something that, that says, this guy's going to be faith and I want to build a nation from him. So he, he sets about making this promise to Abraham that, that he's going to have his own son and even more than that, that his descendants will number like the stars in the sky. This would have seemed crazy to Abraham, given his age and the fact that, that he couldn't have children with his wife. But what was Abraham's response? It was this, and he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him as righteousness. God goes on to say that to Abraham that he's going to give him and his descendants this vast area of land. And Abraham says to God, well, okay, how am, I how, are you going to, how am I going to know that I'll possess what you're saying? So then God says, okay, I'm going to establish a covenant with you. And he tells Abraham to, to bring together some very specific animals. And the, and the animals are cut in half and they're ready for the covenant ceremony to begin. But God causes Abraham to go into this, this kind of deep sleep. And it was a weird kind of sleep because uh, Abraham has sort of got this, this consciousness of what's happening, even though he is unable to participate. He's kind of rendered helpless in a sense. He can't move uh, to take part. And so what Abraham sees is that God moves through the center of these separated animals in the form of a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. And God made, made this covenant promise to Abraham that he would give him and his offspring this very vast and specific area of land. So God had intended the sleep that he put Abraham in to prevent him from getting up and passing through the animal pieces. So Abraham could be no more than a witness to this very unique and special covenant. A covenant where he and his descendants were the recipient of all the benefits of God's promise, but not required to do anything in return. This was a really unique kind of covenant, and it was called a unilateral or unconditional covenant, where only God was responsible for upholding his end. Abraham and his line could do nothing to nullify or violate the covenant in any way. And the covenant was all about blessing and promise. All that Abraham had to do was believe that God would be true to his word. All Abraham did was to believe it, and this is the thing that Paul tries to draw on in an effort to explain to the Galatians the error of the theology that they were embracing. Now let's compare the covenant that God made with Abraham to the one that he made with Moses. And the Mosaic Covenant is kind of the foundations of, the, of the, the Jewish Torah, starting with the Ten Commandments. Now this covenant was what we call a bilateral or conditional covenant between God and man. It was actually a conditional covenant between God and the nation of Israel. So God promised blessing, safety and prosperity to the nation in return for what? in return for their obedience to the requirements of the law. So God will bless his people if they follow the rules. That is, you agree to do these certain things and I will agree to do these things in return. So simply believing to receive the salvation of Jesus almost seemed too easy for the Galatian church. They were more comfortable with, with the idea that you had to work for it this is what the Jews always did. They were always working for it. The, the law was, was, required, was requiring constant obedience and sacrifice, and it was a real weight on their back. And it was, a, it was a belief deeply entrenched into the way that they looked at every aspect of their life. So to move away from this and embrace salvation as a gift that required nothing from them except belief, except faith, was a huge chasm for them to cross. And in their zealousness to make, to make the case, uh, the Jewish Christians had forgotten about the new covenant that God had told them that would be made a, a long time before Jesus even came, came into the picture. 
And this, God had, had foreshadowed the new covenant way back. So what is this new covenant then, and, and when did it come about? So we find we find this this account in in Luke uh, twenty chapter twenty two when when Jesus is having his last meal with the disciples before he is he's tortured and crucified and here's what he says to them after the supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you so the new covenant was made by Jesus at the last meal he shared with his disciples. He was saying to them that, that he himself would become the sacrifice, that gruesome mess that would seal the making of the new covenant between God and man. Just like the unilateral covenant God made with Abraham, where God credited Abraham's belief in his promises as righteousness, Jesus' new covenant is also a unilateral covenant. It's the same type of covenant. And all Jesus asks of us is that we too would believe in him to be saved. We see that so beautifully described by John when he writes in John chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever, whoever, what? whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The old covenant is conditional and the new covenant is unconditional. Trying to amalgamate these two covenants just don't work because they, they pull in different directions. The law, the old Mosaic covenant, can't bring life. It can't change us, and that was never its purpose. The law was all about establishing a perfect standard that we could never live up to in order to show us how sinful we really are. The law was and is always a magnifying glass to spotlight our sins and reminding us of our inability to please God in and of ourselves and our inability to have a relationship with Him. The law cannot and was never designed to save us. It can only condemn us. The law is actually a doing thing. The law is all about doing. I'm required to do what the, Lord's, what the law says irrespective of whether or not I believe the law. Um, generally last year I got pulled over for speeding. I was only a couple of hundred metres from home. And as I was winding down the window when the policeman came to the door, I said to myself, are you serious? Uh, I think he thought I was having a go at him. It was really just my own frustration that I'd let my concentration lapse. But how far do you think I would have got if I'd have said, well, officer, I don't believe in the road safety laws, so look, nice seeing you, I'll be on my way, have a nice day. How far do you think I would have got with that sort of response? So what we're seeing there is that I'm bound by the law. I have to follow the law. It's a doing thing. Irrespective of whether or not we believe the law, we have to follow it. Rules are about doing, not believing. And that's why Paul makes the strong point to the Galatians that law and faith are not the same thing. Verse 13 is a beautiful verse. It describes how Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. That Jesus hung crucified on a tree and became the curse for all mankind. He redeemed mankind through his death and his resurrection and thereby breaking the power of the curse of the law as he upheld his commitment under the new covenant. Why did he do this? Why did he? So that the blessing of Abraham might continue to come to the Gentiles. Remember, what was the blessing of Abraham? He believed God through faith and it was counted to him as righteousness. Like Abraham, we too can experience being in right relationship with God because of what Jesus has done and our belief in that. When we believe that Jesus died for us, we align ourselves with Abraham who said, I believe God, I believe what he said. And in the same way we can say, I believe that what Jesus did on the cross was for me, I believe it. And this is credited to us as righteousness. That means putting you and I in a right relationship with Jesus. So what does this mean for you and I? This detailed account of, of the tension in the early church between the salvation by the law and salvation by believing. 
Well, I don't know for sure, but I'm I'm pretty convinced that most of us here were not born into into Jewish families, not born into a Jewish tradition. So we here today uh, are those Gentiles that God is referring to when He made His covenant with Abraham over four thousand years ago. We are every bit as much children of God's kingdom by believing in God and the promise. Um, and he's promised that the Spirit would come and live within us to make us new people and gradually transform us to become more like Jesus. We should be blown away by this. We should be amazed and encouraged at how God works. So we today are the evidence of God's steadfast commitment to the covenant that he made with Abraham all those centuries ago. Our God is amazingly faithful. In reality, we're just like the Apostle Paul, who lived in the tension between not doing the things that he ought to do and doing the things that he ought not to do. Paul's life, too, was a work in progress, and I'm sure there were times that he wished that he walked with greater integrity. But we can be confident that our relationship with God is secure because of our faith in Jesus and not dependent on us having to follow a system of rules or having to live a faultless life. God knows our heart, and it's fundamentally in his character to extend his grace and forgiveness to us. You know, that's reason for hope, and that's reason for joy, and we should be hopeful and joyful. I'm just going to close in prayer, um, so let's just pray now. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you that you made a new covenant with us, that you, so, that you so loved us, that you wanted to extend to us an opportunity to be part of your family and part of your kingdom. And we thank you too for, your, for the example of your steadfastness and your faithfulness to us that goes back thousands of years. And it can only give us more confidence today that we can trust you and have, and have confidence in you. Um, we thank you for what you've done um, and pray, Father, that you would help us to be diligent and discerning of, of other voices that might tell us that there are other things more important than, than believing and having faith in Jesus as a basis for our faith. So, Father, we thank you for our time together and pray that uh, as we go into this period of, of, of meeting together in our homes, that it would be a time of blessing, that we would be looking out for others to connect with, um, and that our church would grow stronger, even though it looks a little different. So we thank you for, for being with us this morning. We thank you for the truth and power that's in your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit within us. In Jesus' name, amen. for us.
take it I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am I am who you say I am I am who you say I am Who the sun says free Who oh, is free In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am.